presentation this uh, this afternoon will be given to us by Dr. Rico Javian, who is the professor of uh, the systematic theology at the Adventist University of the Philippines. His topic will be almost forgotten bedrock theology of mission. It's a very interesting topic and I'm just curious what is this almost forgotten uh, theology of uh, mission. And I'm sure all of us are excited to, to listen to this presentation. Uh, before we, we give the time to Dr. Javian, shall we have a word of prayer? Shall we stand, please? Let us pray. Our gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we want to thank you one more time. And one more time, invite your presence amidst us, Lord. That this presentation will not be just an academic exercise, but that we will be able to see something that we had never seen before, or that we may be reminded to take it further for the furtherance of your kingdom. Or we want to uh, submit Dr. Javian into your hands. Whatever he has prepared for us, may you bless it, that we will be nourished spiritually. Thank you, Lord, for being here with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Dr. Javin, the time is yours. Let me just add one line. We'll have a 25 minutes of presentation. After that, we'll have 10 minutes of a question answer session. So please get ready with your questions. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, the holy hour is almost past, and we have done a lot of meditation. And so this time is our time. Uh, I really enjoy systematic theology, and this is my try in mission because I'm systematic theology major in mission, minor in mission. Now I'm doing minor things this afternoon. Just, did you remember in your classes that one student who enrolled probably at Fuller Theological Seminary, and the professor told him, okay, since you are interested with mission, you need to study the journeys of Paul. Everything what happened. And then come, uh, come back at the end of the semester for final examination. There is only one examination. So he studied thoroughly everything. The first journey, second, where Paul stopped, what happened in those areas. At the close of the semester, the student appeared. And he said, sir, I'm ready now to take the final exam. And the professor handed to him the examination paper, says, criticize the Sermon on the Mount. <laughs> he said, what in the world? I'm studying Paul missionary journey. I know all, but why should I take this examination? He had no answer. But honestly, he wrote in the paper, I come in this seminary to learn the journey, missionary journeys of Paul. Who am I to criticize the Sermon of the Mount to my Lord? <laughs> Probably I'm on that. Uh, as I said, this is a trial. 
but don't hang me in the balance. Almost forgotten bedrock theology of mission. What is this? We know already that the works, challenges of doing mission in today's world are overwhelming. The same works and challenges that the apostles of the Lord had in the New Testament times. In Acts of the Apostles shows how God has prepared, lead, transform, empower the apostles how to accomplish their work. How the great commission of making disciples of all nations as the work of the gospel of grace of God was literally fulfilled, carried out from Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and even to the known world at the time. As the apostles focused their works to the utmost part of the world came the irrevocable and irrefutable testimony of the successful divine mission for God as it was claimed that these who have turned the world upside down. The Great Commission was equally measured up with great challenges and obstacles in doing mission. Luke records that the teaching and the preaching of the apostle was not smooth one. Today, we would like that our preaching is so nice. But listen to what they have done. He said, It cut their hearts, greatly disturbed the people of Jerusalem. The preaching of Stephen still cut or pricked the heart of the people responded positively and negatively. That's doing mission. The apostles were lovers as troublemakers, as claimed that they have exceedingly troubled our city in Macedonia. They troubled the crowd and the ruler of the people of the city in Thessalonica. They encountered science of humanism of Epicureans against philosophy of the Stoics, the existing philosophies at the time, political barriers, social and cultural barriers. When Paul came back to Jerusalem, all the city was disturbed. Doing and fulfilling mission in reality was not easy at the time and much more in the present day. The Book of Acts has a paradigm in the present day mission as the apostles move according to William Mons, he says, point out that they were telling the same story of Jesus. It's time it's told. It has also a little different emphasis, but still the same story. Sometimes the word responds positively in Acts. Many times also the response, nothing but beating trip to the jail. Whenever Jesus is declared Christ the Lord, it tends to throw other Lord in this array. The result is opposition and reduction. We need to look at really closely to the New Testament how they have done their mission. But significant difference in Acts was that the apostles don't care or bother so much what happened to them. Not like us today. We want to maintain our images. And in fact, every successful mission, Luke usually follows stories of failure. But it appears that failure that they have encountered was not a big deal to them. But doing continually divine command regardless or whatever was the result. They had a Christian life with such astounding dedication, commitment, passion for excellence. That is very difficult to balance today for us to do mission. But they have done that. However, Let's look at Paul. He testified in his letters to the Corinthians. For the weapon of our warfare, meaning to say, doing mission is not. Because, as I said, Christian life is not in the game, but in the battlefield. He said, are not carnal, but mighty in God, pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought to the obedience of Christ. The singleness of intention and purpose dominates their will, doing what Jesus had for them. According to this color, Sample says, 
There are seven truths that change the world. He read the entire book of box, marking, and they are the following. The bodily resurrection of Jesus was central in their mission. Second, the incarnation. Third, the fine-tuned cosmos with the beginning or the ex nihilo, the existence of God as a clear pointer of reality. And salvation is by grace, not by works. The image of God, the foundation of humanity's values and dignity, and God has an excellent reasons for allowing evil and suffering. Through these seven truths, seems non-negotiable in doing mission, and with the maximum power of the Holy Spirit, the apostles and the early Christianity fulfilled the Great Commission as shown below. They have done. Now let's look at Mission accomplished. The Book of Acts records and shows that the servants of God had accomplished carrying God's mission. And it appears that the apostle works of the Great Commission was almost coming to an end. The end of the Great, Com uh, Great Commission was on the verge of finishing taxes and ushering into its catological end of the world. For instance, let us listen to the eschatology of the apostles. In several letters of the apostles, Paul, Peter, James, and John indicate that the parousia was very close. The apostle towards the end of his epistles to the Corinthian Christian in Rome, now is the time to wake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer when we first believe. The night is past and the day is at hand, closing of God's work. The same line of thought is reflected in the middle, beginning, middle, and towards the end of the letters to the Corinthians. He declared, eagerly waiting for the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. The time is short, and the end of ages has come. And then to the Colossians, the same. The word of truth of the gospel, which has been come to you, it was far-reaching since it has also come in all the world. In fact, he assures them that the gospel he heard was preached to every creature under heaven. It's an astounding claim of a finishing task that they have done. It seems mission indeed is accomplished. The tone of almost accomplished mission has been evidenced in the letters to the Christians in Philippi. That God who has begun a good work in you will complete until the day the Lord Jesus. In that they should live without offense till the day of Christ for the reason that the Lord is at hand. And it rings in the book of Hebrews. For a little while wait for it. He is coming and he will not tarry. Likewise, James also picks it up. For the coming of the Lord is at hand, and behold, the judge is standing at the door. Peter the same, also, revelation of Jesus Christ, the end of all things it has hand. John, in the last book of the New Testament, joined the chorus that the time is near, and Jesus assured him three times. Close sequence, behold, I am coming quickly. Meaning to say, they have done their part. They accomplished their mission. Now, let us ask two significant questions that I address in this paper. Significant missiological question needed to be asked in relation to the apostles' attitude, work in accomplishing their mission. Why the apostles were significantly accomplished their mission in spite of the overwhelming challenges and failures before them? What mind human factors and mission strategies that motivated them for the work of the Lord without any reservation that the modern and the postmodern mission are lacking? These are the questions that are addressed in this study. What particular divine human factor? What they have? What kind of attitude? And I call that the bedrock theology of mission that is almost forgotten. The Great Commission appears to be the last parting words of Jesus in one of the signated mountains in Galilee after his resurrection and before his ascension. 
Therefore, it is one of the central and compelling divine human tasks given to the disciples, apostles. In the same high sense, the Great Commission was much with power of the Holy Spirit since he also had given commandments to the apostles. This is a very instructive, instructive verse in the book of Acts. It is because, in other words, what Jesus commanded to the disciples, apostles, before his ascension has been imprinted by the Holy Spirit in their mind so that he had given commandments to the apostles. That short verse is very interesting. The Great Commission is one significant word that has not given much attention. It is a single term that makes the Great Commission having a distinct difference in doing mission. It is almost forgotten. Words since missiologists are or still interested focused in other aspects and things of doing mission. However, this word seems to be forgotten, but actually it is the bedrock theology of mission the word is commanded. We always say go. This one, we more, what we forgot this word, the bedrock. I call that the bedrock almost forgotten because it is the entirety of what Jesus commanded, especially if you read the book of John, chapters 13 to 17. That expression, I have commanded you, and the word commanded is used once in the Great Commission, but in John it is repeatedly used associated with the term new commandment, command, and commandments, and in Luke, commandment is associated with giving instruction of the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, the world will know if you love one another. The world will know if you love this, follow this new commandment. And so, this word group are significant for they are inherently associated with God and Christ's love and the sequel of its timing just before Christ's crucifixion. The word command led vividly look back to the entire events that occurred within John 13 to 17, that is before his crucifixion. This particular chapter in John could be illustrated as the last will and testament of Jesus to his disciples. Therefore, the word, the word is an indelible marker of the Lord when he emphatically declared I have commanded you. Now, according to this scholar, just as the Son keeps the Father's commandment and abide in His love, so the disciples remain in the Son's love when they keep His commandment. Remember that word, love, instruction, teaching, orientation, way of life. That's the whole package of that word, command. And so, Besides that, it is because in Jan, commandment of love is the sum of the commandments besides it is being self-revelation. When Jesus declared to his disciples that I have commanded you to Jan, Ulan says, the Lord refers to his teaching first and foremost of their own obedience, secondarily as something to pass to others, the instruction of the Lord entails the idea of replication. This one, according to Nicol, without adequate instruction in great vital truths of the gospel, there can be no true religious life. At the same time, it's a wonderful love of Christ that subdues the heart. Without genuine love for Christ, the doctrines and forms of religion lose their meaning and value. This is part of the bedrock theology of mission. Let me explain. We have done excellent job, planning strategy. But unless all what we have done is apart from God's love, we are then doing mission, but actually we are not. That's my conviction. According to Bloom, he affirms that the 11 disciples would only survive in his absence by obeying his example of love. The command is new is that it is a special love for other believers based on sacrificial love of Jesus Christ. 
the divine guarantee was parallel. As Jesus was the embodiment of God's love, so now each disciple should embody Christ's love. In other words, Jesus indicates that we stand in him in relation corresponding to that which he stand to God the Father. And that this that Jesus' disciples' future works depend on their attitude toward one another. According to Tinney, he stressed that love has been underscored many times. And in the Great Commission is only one word, commanded. Unity instead of rivalry. We have found that in our church and leadership. Trust in, instead of suspicion. We have that today in our church. In reality, obedience instead of self-assertion must rule the disciples' work. He defends that the measure of their love for one another is his love for them. And so, the disciples' obedience to Jesus was the ultimate test of their love. This was explicitly manifested in them when John says, This is how we know what is love. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brethren. This is divine motivational factor behind all the works of God or behind the Great Commission. Listen to more of what John says. In this love of God was manifested towards us and God sent his son. Beloved, if God so love us, we also love one another. His love has been perfected in us. We abide in him and he in us. That's divine human factor and motivation why the 12 disciples able to fulfill finish the great commission we have known he said and we believe that god has for us we love him because he first loved us and this is the commandment we have from him that he who loves god must love his brother also this was the encapsulated theology of mission Divine human motivation. What are our motivation? Sometimes baptism. Number, we have that this morning. But here we need to understand that mission begins with God. Since mission is a divine activity springing directly from God's nature. It is acknowledged that mission is not human invention. The object of mission is the world. However, Peter does not answer the question. But the nature of God, but citing Jan, it is assumed it is the divine love. It is this love that Jesus came in form of a helpless baby. In the divine love that he lived, died, resurrected, there is no other reason. This scholar said, notes also, the Great Commission is certainly biblical motivation, but it's not sufficient alone. Divine guidance, calling, gifting, having been significant motivation for mission, calling certainly motivation we find many in scripture. The highest motive must remain rooted in the person of God himself, his love for the world, his redemptive work in Christ. Thus, they insist when the great commission is carried with a great commandment is laid out, God's glory will be magnified. I always told my leaders in the South, sir, I said, Elder, there's something wrong. There was a time when Elder Ang was in our division, auditing membership. Baptism, 350,000. Backslide, half a million. Oh. Here in this forum, it was really, and that's why we said, because very soon, South Philippines, Union Conference will be greater than North America. Later on, we found out that we have a greater backslider that was inside the church. What's wrong? I always say to my leaders, I said, whether you believe it on me or not, but I have the conviction. Don't believe on my conviction. Just study what the Bible says. The greatest commission can only be accomplished when the prerequisite of the greatest commandment is first followed. Many are doing mission, 
but without this first. And so, that's what I think. In other words, the divine prerequisite in order to fulfill the Great Commission is the greatest commandment. And what is that? Love God with all your heart, all your strength. When you love all, you have nothing left. And Jesus says, love your neighbor. When you do it so, when I do it, when you do it, everybody do it, the Great Commission is finished. Yeah. That's the almost forgotten. Yeah. It is the love. Now, let's look at it. Let's, let's finish. The same human divine motivation of mission in Peter manifested. Listen to Ellen White. No, I have that. Look at Paul. Listen carefully. In support to this idea, for example, Paul, as pointed out by Ellen White, the love of the Savior was the undying motive. What is our motive? Oh, to be known. I have done my work. That upheld his conflict with self and his struggle against evil. As in the service of Christ, he pressed forwards against unfriendliness of the world and opposition of his enemy. That's what Ellen White says. Very instructive. It, the apostles, the 12 of them, they have the love of Jesus Christ. That's the ultimate motivation. And listen to what he says. The same divine human motivation of mission Peter had. Obedience to the word produces first of the required quality and thin love of the brethren. This love is heaven born and leads to a high motives and unselfish action of the apostle. To Jan, Ellen White said, notes that the transforming love, self sacrifice, it is that moves the people, the disciples. And if you try to look at, listen, why they have accomplished. They said, Ellen White says, they had a clear conception of the love of God and the nature of that love. And they fulfilled the mandate of the Great Commission. They rebelled the love to Christ and enjoined them. And so, meaning to say, what I say is the forgotten. When we are doing mission, if the love of God is not the one who possesses us, we might do, but actually, what God needs is the hearts that belongs to him that is full of love because you are reaching the hearts that belongs to God. That's what, what, what we need. Let me finish this one. The same also, if you to look at Paul. What Paul says in Romans chapter 13, 8, he says, the law of God is fulfilled in one word. Love your neighbor. He forgot the first one. Why? Because previous verses he says, love of God. Meaning to say, I can only fulfill the Great Commission when the love of Christ take my whole being. Because when you feel in love, there is no problem. Look at the apostles. They go to jail, praise the Lord. Right? They were persecuted, praise the Lord. Today, no. I don't want to go to jail. This is what we need. So, the for almost forgotten bedrock theology of mission is let's go back to Jesus' instruction. The world will know if you love one another. Because the only thing, the real matter in life is that, according to my study, the only way to show our love to God is to love our neighbors. Not the same feathers. Those unlovable, those are our neighbors. And it's very difficult. And according to my study, I don't want to finish it. We human beings, according to Paul, the debt of love, and we cannot pay that. We want to pay all the debts, the account we have. But love that is from God, we can never pay. And that's the forgotten theology of mission. We need to revive that again, my brothers and sisters in the ministry. The paradigm of the New Testament is very clear. They don't care. We have our distinctive beliefs, 
but they have that love. They understood that love, and by understanding that love, they fulfill their mission. Those of you, practicality. We understand our wives. Right? Is your wife perfect? Are you perfect? But since love is that, we fulfill and we enjoy life. Right? Although sometimes there's a quarrel. This reality. And so, in our lives, that's why I look at the presentation this morning. Although they did not mention love, but it is there. But I wanted this really. When we do mission, the love of Jesus must be there. As a teacher, I always say my students are candidates for heaven, not only candidates for graduation. Right? Even the hardest one, the most difficult one to have a hard time passing. That's me. Before I end, let me put one thing. I was here at IS. There was a Chinese man from Beijing who came. He wanted to study English. However, he landed on Bible study. He learned much English. After that, he decided, he said, I want to be baptized, but I don't want to be a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And that just pastor was the storm. The other pastor were the storm. All other. And then they come to me, Pastor, do you want to baptize a person who does not become a member of our church? I said, can I talk to him? I talked to him. Two hours. I understand. I said, okay. Are you ready? Because I know you love the Lord. But you don't want our church. Why? He did not say, I love your Lord. I love what I learned from this God. So I arranged the Bilia Soul there. There is a, a swimming pool there. The owner was a backslider. Because I went there and he said, oh, you are a pastor. You know, pastor, we are, pastor, we are Adventists before. We study EUP. But when we migrated to the United States, here we come back. We don't know what is our religion. But when you come, it's okay. With entire family, free. So I arranged for baptism. And the Chinese man told me, Pastor, no record, no story, no official picture. I'll go with brief, and you baptize me. After baptism, I need to walk with my Lord. So I arranged with some of those who are baptized. I was surprised. Three months, he came to church at Ayas. Just before uh, in Beijing, he told me, Pastor, please. Now I enjoy, there is a nice church in Beijing. He was a professor of Beijing University. Now, suppose if I refuse. He loves the Lord. But the pastor don't love people who does not belong to Adventist church. <laughs> Let's forget. The bedrock of theology of mission is Jesus' love exemplified even in the most difficult situation. I want to end there. Again, the bedrock theology of mission, the word commanded is compassive with love and all what Jesus had. I think that's the reality. Thank you for standing. <laughs> Thank you, sir, for, for the good presentation. We have only five minutes for question and answer session. Within these five minutes, let's make a good use of it. <laughs> okay, please uh, make your question brief and to the point, all right? And please, uh, we have the, the microphone with uh, Pastor Liang. Okay, uh, Dr. Esso is the first question behind there. Maybe if you can help us to come a little bit front. Any other? Any other question after that? Yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate uh, the presentation. Uh, my question is about uh, the way we, we teach also our theology when we prepare people. Because there are also areas in theology. For example, when we talk about the Laodicean message, it seems to me like uh, 
we are saying that we are in the stage of where people have kind of characteristics. It seems like those characteristics, how do you deal with? Do you accept those characteristics as the, what is going on? Or how can we do so that it will not happen? And why those characteristics are in the Bible saying that the Laodicean church will be like this? This is the first, the, the first problem that I have. The second problem is about our theology of uh, also the first and the, the later reign. It seems like uh, if there is no, they had the first reign, that's where it's, everything happened there. And now we are saying most of the time that we are waiting the later reign. That maybe it's at that moment that people will be more zealous. They will have more love. They will have, maybe they will do the greetings that the apostles were doing before. I don't know how to reconcile all this, uh, uh, this teaching together. Okay, thank you. Your first problem, I think I cannot answer that. That's your problem. Okay? <laughs> the second one is with regards to the idea of theology, yes. We need to understand that sometimes our teachings prevented us in reaching other people because we think we are the elite. Right? That's the problem. When we think we are elite, we are not following Jesus. Because Jesus, when he came, there is no, according to Isaiah 53, there was no beauty in him that we desire him. In fact, he looked like an ordinary person. And we don't like ordinary person. We want executive because they are easy to be executed. Hmm? That's the problem. And so, here, in doing mission, let me answer the second part. Did you remember that there are almost 20 countries during the time when the Pentecost. And according to Ellen White, these 17 countries, they went back 30, 40 years later. They were the one ringing, so the disciples had already had some idea who brought those different parts known world at the time. That's why in the end, what I'm waiting for is the lettering. Because when the lettering comes, I think all what we have done, the Adventists have done throughout the whole world, I really see that is a time for harvest. Because in the latter end, we don't discuss so much our images, our identity. What we need to look at is Jesus is coming, his righteousness, and we need to be prepared. But today, we are not on that stage yet. I hope I answer your question. Because I finish all the time, so that no more question. Thank you. One more question, just one minute if you have. If you don't have, we will go to the next session. Uh, in case you have uh, any questions that you would like to ask, not just for this uh, presentation, but any other time, uh, any other presentation that your questions have not been answered here, please write them down and hand it over to one of the leaders here, Pastor Liang is here, and uh, Pastor, uh, Pastor Ron is there, and Pastor Tang. Any one of them, please hand over your questions. We will attempt to answer them tomorrow during the question answer panel session in the afternoon. Okay. I would like to thank you, sir, once again for your good presentation. Please, uh, our president. Yeah, on behalf of the IS Asian Theological Society, I would like to present this certificate of appreciation to uh, Professor Rico Javian in his valuable presentation on the almost forgotten bedrock theology of mission. During the third IS Asian Theological Society annual forum with the theme making disciples, opportunities, and challenges of developing faithful disciples in Asia. On June 12 to 13, 2015, at Adventist International Institute of Advanced Studies, Lalang Wan Silang Cavite, Philippines. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, this is the more token of appreciation. Thank you so much. Thank you.